Okay, so now that you are aware of what a Kubernetes cluster is, what a node is, and what pods are, now let's assume that one of these pods goes down. Let's assume that the Nginx pod goes down. Now, if the Kubernetes cluster has to retain back to its previous state, then it has to have something called as a controller. So now let's look at what a controller is. So in Kubernetes, controllers are basically control loops that watch for the state of your particular cluster and then make or request changes whenever it is needed. So each controller tries to move the, from the current state closer to the desired state. So if you look at the previous example, if your particular Nginx pod goes down, then it is the job of the Kubernetes controller to make sure that it comes up again. So as stated previously, the controller is one of the main components that make up the control plane of your Kubernetes cluster. So in our next chapter, we'll talk about deployment. So deployment is basically a configuration file which contains all information of how the desired state of your particular cluster should look like. Okay, so before I end this chapter, let's try to delete one of these pods. Let's try to delete the Nginx pods that we've created. So again, to do this, we need to run another kubectl command called kubectl delete pod. So let's run this particular command. So as you can see, we have two pods currently running. So let's try to delete the Nginx pod that we have. Delete pods. And you just need to give the name of your pod, which is basically Nginx. So let's try to delete this. And you can see that this particular pod has been deleted. So if you run a kubectl get pods again, you'll see that there is only one HTTPD pod that is currently running. And so that's it for this chapter. So in this chapter, you also learned on how you can delete your particular pod using the kubectl pod delete pod command. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so now let's talk about what Kubernetes is. So Kubernetes is a portable, extensible open source platform that is used for managing containers. So some of the tasks that Kubernetes can do for you includes load balancing of your containers, self-healing. So self-healing means that one of your containers, let's suppose if it goes down, so Kubernetes can help create or recreate a new container in place of the old one. It can also do automated rollbacks and rollouts. So if you have a newer version for your containers, then it can roll out those newer versions as well. And finally, it also helps in automatic bin packing, which configures how much CPU and memory each container should get. So these are some of the major and important functionalities of Kubernetes. So I will see you in the next chapter. Okay, so now let's talk about Kubernetes cluster. A Kubernetes cluster is a set of nodes that runs your containerized application. Now there are three terms that I would like you guys to know beforehand itself. And they are the control plane, the node and the pods. So the control plane also called as the master node is responsible for managing the entire cluster. Apart from that, there is also the node, which can also be termed as the slave node. So it's within these slave nodes, which are basically just virtual machines. If you're running it in a cloud environment, so each node corresponds to a virtual machine if you're running it in AWS, Azure, or GCP. And these nodes are basically the virtual machines within which your containerized application runs. Okay, so now that we've talked about your node and your control plane, let's talk about another very important abstraction that you will hear very often in Kubernetes, and that is the pod. And it's within these pods that your containers reside. So one pod can contain more than one number of containers, and it's basically how you configure your pod. So that's it for this lecture. So the main takeaway from this particular lecture is that there are three important terms that you should remember. That is the control plane, the node, and the pod. So these are terms you'll hear very often, and you must remember what these terms mean. And I'll also give you a link in the description below, so you can just check that out for more information about these three terms. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, so now let's talk about the control plane or the master node. So the master node is responsible for managing your cluster. So the control plane or the master node coordinates all the activities in your cluster, such as scheduling your application, maintaining, maintaining your application's desired state, scaling applications, and rolling out new updates. So these are features that you'll keep learning as you proceed towards in this course. So these are some of the main features of your control plane. Okay, so now let's talk about the four major components that make up your control plane. They include the API server, the ETCD, the Kube scheduler, and the Kube control manager. Now, I know it's too early for you to go in depth into all these four major components, so I'll be just giving you a brief overview so that you can understand on what these components do. So the first is the API server. So the API server exposes an HTTP API that lets end users and different parts of your cluster communicate with each other. So whenever you're sending a request to your cluster, just keep in mind that it goes to your API server and it's the API server that decides where your particular request has to go to. 
Now, apart from that, there is the ETCD, which is basically a consistent and a highly available key store used by Kubernetes for backing store for all your cluster data. Now, apart from that, there is also the cube scheduler. So whenever a new pod is created and there is no assigned node to that particular pod, it is the cube scheduler which defines on which, which particular node that particular pod has to run in. So that is the main duty of the cube scheduler. And then there is the cube control manager. So the cube control manager has got many responsibilities, which includes it's responsible for noticing and responding whenever a node goes down. It watches for job objects that represents one of tasks and then creates pods so that these particular job objects can run on them. This is something that you'll understand in the upcoming chapter. So do not worry about it. So whenever I talk about the job controllers and the endpoint controller, that is it populates the endpoint objects, that is it joins services and pods. I will tell you that these particular tasks are done by the cube control manager. So do not worry about understanding some of these terms and concepts. And finally, it's also responsible for creating service accounts. So these are some of the important tasks that the cube control manager looks into. So finally, Please do not worry if some of these terms are alien to you or you do not understand. Now, as we proceed in the course, it will become much clearer to you what the job control manager does. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, so now let's talk about the node. So whenever you're running your Kubernetes cluster in a cloud environment like GCP, Azure, or AWS, a node represents a virtual machine. So let's assume that you're creating a three node architecture. So what this actually means is that you're creating three virtual machines in your Kubernetes cluster. And it's within these three virtual machines that your containers would run. So each node contains a set of modules that is common for all of them. And they include the kubelet, the kube proxy, and the container runtime. So the kubelet is an agent that runs on each node in the cluster. And it makes sure that your containers are running in a pod. Now let's talk about the kube proxy. A kube proxy is a network proxy that runs on each node in your cluster. And this is an implementing part of the Kubernetes service concept. So this is something that we'll talk about when we talk about the service object in Kubernetes. So when I talk about the service or service object in Kubernetes, then you'll understand what kube proxy actually does. And then finally, there is the container runtime. And the container runtime is the software that is responsible for running the containers. So I hope you understood what these three modules are and what they do. So I will see you in the next chapter. Okay, so now let's look at ways in which you can deploy your Kubernetes cluster. Now there are many ways, but the three main are the ones that I've shown right now. The first is using a tool called Minikube. So you use Minikube if you just want to work around with Kubernetes. So, so Minikube is never used in production and it's only used if you want to learn or you want to see how Kubernetes works. So if you're using Minikube, you have a virtual machine and within this virtual machine, both your master node and your normal node resides. The disadvantage of using something like Minikube is you cannot add more nodes. So you have your node and your master within the same virtual machine and everything is just restricted to one VM. Now, if you want your Kubernetes cluster in production, then you use a tool called KubeADM. So using KubeADM, you need to configure your master node as well as your slave node. So you need to first create your master node and then you need to create your slave nodes and then you need to link them up together. So this is a more complex process and this requires more expertise in Kubernetes. So if you have a lot of expertise in Kubernetes, then this is the preferred way of deploying your Kubernetes cluster in production. And, and then there is the third way using your cloud providers like AWS, GCP and Azure. Now, just by clicking a few buttons, you can have your Kubernetes cluster installed. That is how simple it is. And the best thing about using your cloud providers is that your master node is highly available and you do not need to worry about the reliability or the availability of the master node if you're using these cloud providers. So I would prefer having my Kubernetes cluster deployed in my cloud provider rather than using a Kube ADM. Now, that depends on the requirement of the company, but, but personally, I would prefer using a cloud provider to have my Kubernetes cluster deployed. So that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we will see how you can use Minikube to have your Kubernetes cluster deployed in a single virtual machine. So I'll see you there. Okay, in this particular session, we'll install two things. We'll install the Minikube. So you need Minikube to create a cluster in Kubernetes. So once you have installed Minikube, you can create a cluster in Kubernetes. And after you've installed your Minikube, the next thing that you want to install is a tool called kubectl. And this kubectl will be used to interact with the Kubernetes cluster that we've created using Minikube. So to install your Minikube, you need to go to this particular URL and you need to install based on which particular operating system and which particular architecture you have. So for example, if you want to install for Linux, you can just choose your Linux 
and you can install based on which particular architecture. Now, since we have Windows, I'll just click on Windows and I'll download the exe. And once I've downloaded the exe, I can just install it. So I've already done this part. And once you've done your mini cube, the next thing that you want to install is cube CTL. Now it's the same process for cube CTL as well. So you can just use this particular page to install cube CTL for your application. Now there's an installation for Windows as well as for Linux. So if you want to install for Linux, you need to open this particular page. That is it for this particular section. The links to both these pages I'll give in the description below. So you can just go check it out and, and deploy it based on which particular architecture or operating system you're using. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, so now that you've installed Minikube and kubectl, the first command that you need to run to start your cluster is called as Minikube start. So let's do that. So now it's initializing the Kubernetes cluster. Now look, now if you look to the right, you can see how the architecture of this particular cluster will look like. So this is going to be a cluster with one, just one particular node. And this particular node will contain multiple pods and these pods are segregated based on namespaces. So there are two default namespaces that you would want to know initially. The first one is the cube system. So the cube system contains pods that contain all the components that make up the master node. So now let's just clear the screen. And the first command that you would want to run is called as the kubectl. So kubectl is basically the CLI that is used to communicate with the Kubernetes cluster. So the first command would be kubectl get node. So this will give you all the nodes that are currently available in this cluster. Now, since we created just one particular node when we did the mini cube start. So let's see how many nodes are there when we run this particular command. And you can see that there is just one node and this particular node and this particular node also acts as the control plane or the master node. So this particular node that we have created acts both as the master node and as well as the slave node. So within this particular node, you can create different application related pods as well. So that's the first command that you would want to run. Okay, so now that you know that this particular cluster has one node, now let's see how many pods are currently available in this particular cluster. To do that, let's run the kubectl get pods. And this will give you all the pods that are there in the default namespace. So let's see how many are there in the default namespace. So you can see that it gives a response saying that there are no resources found in the default namespace. Now to get information about all the pods within this particular cluster, what you need to do is you need to run the kubectl get pods and you need to give a slash a. And this will give you all the pods within this cluster. Now this particular command will not only give you all the pods that are there in the default namespace, so this would include pods that are available in the cube system. So this would include things like the ETCD, the scheduler, the API server, etc. So let's run this particular command. And you can see that you get a lot of information when you run this particular command. So you also get information about the pods that are currently available in the cube system and also other pods that are running in other namespaces, which includes Ingress and Kubernetes dashboard. So these are namespaces that we'll talk about in a later section. So currently you can see that these cube system namespace contains pods that are used in the master node, which includes things like the API server, the scheduler, the etcd, etc. So these pods are currently also residing within this particular node that we've created. So finally, before we end this section, let's create one pod in our default namespace. Now to create a pod, there are multiple ways, but I'll start by creating a pod using the most simple kubectl run command. So to run that, you just need to run the kubectl run. And here you need to give a name for your particular pod. So let's just call this pod as nginx. And then all that you need to give is the image that you want to run within that particular pod. So the image would just be an nginx with the tag latest. And let's run this particular command. And here you can see that there's an output called that this particular pod has been created. So again, let's do a kubectl get pods and you can see that the default now has one particular pod running within it and its status is container creating so let's wait for this to be created and now it states that this particular pod is running so that is it for this lecture so in this lecture you saw on how you can create a kubernetes cluster using the mini cube start and then you've learned about namespaces. So there are two namespaces that are important, the cube system. So the cube system contains pods that are used by the master 
node. And there's also something called as a default namespace. So within this default namespace, you can create your pods that would be used by your application. So that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so now that we've created our cluster along with two pods, that is the HTTP and the Nginx pod. Now let's talk about a very important command that you should know as a beginner, and that is the kubectl describe command. So with this particular command, you can get valuable information about each particular object in Kubernetes. So let's, so let's start by doing a kubectl describe. And let's describe the node and let's see what information we can get. Now this is a very important command as a beginner. So this particular command gives you valuable information about your particular node. So let's run this particular command. So this gives you valuable information. Now, from our point of view, the most important information we need to know is what are the pods that are currently running within this particular node. And here you can see that there are two separate nodes, pods. And here you can see that there are two separate pods, one for HTTPD and another one for Nginx. So this is one important information that we can get. And another important information that we can get is basically the IP address of this particular node. And the IP address of this particular node we can see is 192.168.49.2. So this is an internal IP address of this particular node. So if you need to access this particular node, you need to use this particular IP address. And apart from this, it also gives you information about the memory, the CPU, etc., for each of this particular pod within the node. So for example, here you can see the CPU, the limits, the memory, the memory limits, etc., and the age of this particular pod. So this is the first important command that you can execute once you've created your particular node. That is the kubectl describe command. And similarly, let's do a kubectl describe for the pods that we have created. Now, the second command that I would like you guys to know is the kubectl get pods. And let's see the output of this. And here you can see that there are two pods currently running, the HTTPD and the Nginx. So now let's get information about each one of these pods. So let's do a kubectl describe pod HTTPD. And here you can get all the information about this particular pod. So the important information is what are the containers that are running within this particular pod. So I have an HTTPD latest image that is running within this particular pod. And another important information is the IP address of this particular pod. So the IP address for this pod is 172.17.03. So these are some of the important information that you can get for this particular pod. And similarly, let's run the same for the Nginx pod as well. And you can get the same information here. The IP address is this. This is the image of the container within that particular pod. So this particular pod has just one container. Now it's, po now it's possible for one pod to have multiple containers. So it's based on how you design your architecture. So that's it for this lecture. So in this lecture, you've learned a very important command called describe. So describe as a beginner should be the first command that you should look into once you've created your cluster in Kubernetes. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so now that you know the IP address of your node as well as of your pods, that is HTTP and Nginx. So let's do one thing. Let's try to log into one of these pods. And once we log into one of these pods, we'll try to access the other pod. So we have Nginx web server running in one server, one pod, and we have HTTP running on the other server. So what I'll do is I log into HTTP and I will curl this particular IP address and let's see if you're able to communicate. So so here what I need to do is I need to log into the container within this particular pod. So let's do that. So the command that you need to run is kubectl exec. And then you need to give the name of your pod, which is httpd. And then you need to run it in an interactive mode. So you just keep it. And then you need to give the shell in which you want to run this particular command. So it will be the bin bash shell. OK, so now I've entered the container within the pod HTTPD. So this is again the HTTPD container. So let's do an LS. And within this particular container is our Apache web server. So now what I need to do is let's go back to our 
diagram here. So what I am, I'm currently logged in into this particular HTTPD container that is within this particular pod. So what I need to do is I just need to ping this particular Nginx web server. And this Nginx web server is in this particular location that is this particular IP address. So let's do that. So I'll just run the curl command. And the IP address is 172.17.03. And it's on port 80. So let's run for. And you can see that you get a message that looks like this. So it just returns a message saying that it works. So that means that you are able to communicate between these two pods. So now this is not the ideal way in which you're supposed to communicate. So this is just an example of how you can communicate between these two pods. So ideally, you're supposed to use a cluster IP address. And that is something that I will talk about in the next lecture. So this lecture was just to show you two things. The first thing is that you can use your pod IP address to communicate with each other. And the second thing is you can use the kubectl exec command to log into the containers within your pod. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so before we go any further, let's just reiterate on all the commands that we learned so far. The first command was the minikube start command. So the minikube start command was to create a Kubernetes cluster with one node. Once we created the cluster, the next command that we ran was the kubectl run command to create two pods. So we created two pods. One was the HTTPD pod and the other one was the Nginx pod. And within each one of these pods, we created a container. So the HTTPD pod contains one HTTPD that is Apache web server container. And similarly, the Nginx pod contains the Nginx web server container within that. And after you use the kubectl run command, we use the kubectl get, get command to get to list all the nodes and to list all the pods that we've created. And after that, we ran the kubectl describe pod and the pod name to get all information about all the pods within our particular node. So this would give us information about all the containers running within the pod, as well as the IP address, the local IP address of that particular pod. And once we've ran that, we ran the kubectl exec command to log into one of those containers. So we logged into the HTTPD container within the HTTPD pod. And then we were able to ping the Nginx web server in another particular pod. So that's it for this lecture. So before you proceed any further, please make sure to run all these commands once and to check whether things are working as it is supposed to be. So that's it for this section. I will see you in the next. Okay, so there are a few ways in which you can create your deployment configuration. One is using the command line and another is using a JSON file. In this particular example, we'll use the simplest method to create a deployment. So let's go to our console and let's create a fetch deployment. Okay, so let's create a fetch deployment. So to do that, you just need to run the kubectl create command and then we need to give deployment. And the name of my deployment would be nginx again. And then all that you need to give is the image which would be nginx latest. And finally, you can also give the number of replicas that you want for this deployment. So if you do not set the replica, then it defaults to one. So what a replica is something that I will mention after I create this particular deployment. So let's run this deployment. And you can see that our deployment is created. So let's run a kubectl get deployment. And you can see that there is a deployment that has been created and this deployment is currently creating one particular replica of our pod. So again, let's do a cube CTL get pod to see if any pods have been created by this particular deployment. And you can see that one particular pod has been created. Now, the advantage of using a deployment is if I delete this particular pod, then this deployment will make sure that another particular pod comes up again or spawned up again. So let's try to run, do that. So let's do a kubectl delete pod and let's try to delete this particular pod. And you can see that the pod has been deleted. So if I try to do a kubectl get pod again, let's see what happens. And here you can see that another pod is being replicated or being created. So that is the advantage of using deployment. Now deployment not only helps in recreating these pods, but it has other functionalities involved as well. So these new functionalities we'll keep talking about as we pass through this particular course. Now 
Okay, so that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll talk about another very important concept called as cluster IP address. So I will see you in the next chapter. Okay, so in our previous chapter, we had deleted the Nginx pod and recreated a new one using our deployment. Now the problem here is that the IP address or the private IP address associated with this particular pod I pod could have changed. So what we need to do is we need to create a static IP address that we can assign to this particular pod. And once we do that, even if the HTTP D container tries to ping this particular Nginx container, it will still work because as long as the IP address remains constant, then even if the pod keeps changing or gets deleted and recreated again, it still wouldn't matter. So let's see how we can do that. Now to do this, what we need to do is we need to create a IP address called as a cluster IP address. And this cluster IP address would be associated with that particular pod and would remain so unless we manually delete it. So let's create a cluster IP address. Okay, so I'm back in my console. So let's look at all the pods that we currently have. Now again, to do that, let's just run the kubectl get pods command. And we have two particular pods. This particular pod was created using the kubectl run command. And this was used using the kubectl deployment command. So what we need to do is we need to create our cluster IP IDs for both these pods. So let's create it first for our HTTPD. Now to do that, what you need to do is you need to run the kubectl expose command. And then you need to mention the pod. So the pod here is HTTPD. And then you need to mention the port that you will open for that particular port. So the port that you will open would be port 8080. And you also need to mention the target port. So there should be a double slash here. Then you also need to mention the target port. So the target port is the port on which your particular application within that container is running. So since we have Nginx, which is, uh, since we have HTTPD, which is running on port 80, so we need to mention port 80 here. And this would be port 80. So again, the port 80 mentions represents the uh, port of the container that is running the application. And port 8080 is the port for the particular port which is going to be opened. And let's run this particular application now. And you can see that it has been created. Now to see the cluster IP address of your particular port, what you need to do is you need to run the kubectl get service. And let's run this particular command. And here you can see that our HTTPD pod has been created and it has a cluster IP address of 10, 1, 0, 5, 2, 1, 8, and 38. So similarly, let's also create a cluster IP address for our Nginx. So for our Nginx, what we would do is we would expose the deployment and not the port pod since we had created this particular pod through the deployment. So let's run the same command again. So here the only difference would be what we would do is we would just mention here as a deployment. And again, the name of our deployment is Nginx. Everything else is the same. So again, for this particular pod, we will open port 8080. And this particular pod, which is running Nginx, is on. And this particular pod, which contains the tar, and this particular pod, which contains the Nginx container, is running on port a port 80 so let's run this command as well and you can see that another service has been created so let's run the kubectl again kubectl get service again and then you can see here that there are two cluster ips that are created okay so now that we've created the cluster id let's try to use the cluster id instead of using the internal ip address so again what i'll do is i will log into httpd and i will try to ping the nginx server using this particular cluster IP address. So let's do that. So let's log in using the kubectl exit command. Okay, so what I'll do now is I'll ping the Nginx pod and its cluster ID is this and the port ID that I need to use is 8080 because what I've done is I've exposed port, port 8080. So let's do that. So I'll do a curl. and the port is 8080. And you can see that I get a successful response. So again, this is just a welcome uh, HTML page that you see here. Okay, so now you know that you can use your curl command to ping this particular web server. So, okay, so the good thing now here is that even if I delete this particular pod and a new pod will be created and I can still access that new pod using this particular cluster IP ID. So let's do that. So I'll open another 
PowerShell Let's do a cube CTL get pods So let me remove this particular pod now since I have created this particular pod, pod using the deployment a new pod will get recreated so let's do a cube CTL delete pod and let's name this particular pod paste and let's run this and you can see that the pod is deleted so now let's do a cube ctl get pods and here you can see that a new pod is being created again so let's wait for this particular container to be created okay so my new my new pod is running currently so let's again use the same same curl command and use the same ip address now if i run this again you can still see that I get the same message. Now, even though this is a new pod that I had created, which is linked to with this particular cluster IP address. So I hope this was a useful lecture. So in this particular lecture, you've understood the use of using your cluster IP address. So even if your pod gets deleted, now as long as your deployment recreates another pod, that particular pod can also be accessed using the same IP address. So that is the entire gist of using your, using your cluster IP address. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so in our previous chapter, we had created a cluster ID for our Nginx pod. So what we will do in this particular chapter is we'll create a deployment and we will create three replicas for that particular deployment. So what will happen is that there will be three pods created and each of these pods would have a particular label and this label would be app equal to node app. So this would be basically the name of the deployment itself. So based on the name of the deployment, a label will get created. So let us create this particular deployment. So for this particular deployment, I've created a node application and let me show you this particular node application. So all that it does is it just returns the IP address back to the user. And I'm using this particular network interface function to do this. And this particular, this particular code is in a repository that I will paste in the description below. So you can just check it out if you want to. And I have created a container image out of this particular code. And this particular container image is in a public repository that also I will paste in the description below. So let me show you the image that I have created. So this particular image is in this particular repository. So this particular repository link, which is a public repository will also be sent in the description below. So you can just check it out. So like I said previously, just give the IP address back to the user. So the first thing that we'll do is let me clear the screen and let's go back to our PowerShell. Okay, so now let's create a deployment. Now to create the deployment again, you just need to run the kubectl create deployment. You just need to give the name for your deployment. So I'll just call this as node app. Now here the node is referring to node.js and not the node of that particular Kubernetes cluster. And then what you need to mention is the image name. So the image would be, so this is the image. So let me just copy this and let's paste it. Let's paste it over here. And that's about it. So let's run this, but, and yeah, finally, you also need to mention the replicas. So here I'm going to create three replicas for my particular deployment. So let's run this. Okay, so our deployment has been created. So let's do a kubectl get deployment. So you can see that our deployment is created. And let's do the kubectl get nodes. Sorry, kubectl get pods. And here you can see that there are three that got created. So two of them are in a running state and the third one is being created. Now let's do one thing. So if you go back to the diagram, you can see that there is a label assigned to these particular nodes. So let's see if these particular labels are present. So again, to do that, you can just do a kubectl get, sorry, describe. And let's look at this particular description for this particular pod. And here you can see that for this particular pod, there is a label that got created. 
Now, this particular label was based on the deployment name that we had mentioned. So while creating the deployment, the name that we had mentioned was node app. So based on that, this particular label got generated as app equal to node app. Okay, so if you go check out the other pods, those three pods will similarly have the same label. Let's check out one more to verify this. So let's check this particular pod and let's see whether this particular pod also has that same label. Let's do a kubectl describe. And if you check this particular pod, this particular pod also has the same label. Okay, so now that we've created the three pods, let's go back to our document, our presentation ones. So you can see that using the deployment, we were able to create three replicas of our node application. And all these three have the similar label called app node app. So this app node app was based on the name of the particular deployment that we had created. Okay, so now that we've created the deployment, the next thing that we need to do is we need to create the cluster IP using the kubectl expose command. So let's clear the screen. And what we need to use is the kubectl expose. And here we need to mention the deployment. And the name of the deployment here matters. So the name that we had given is node app. And it is based on this that the selector would also get created. So when I run this particular command with deployment node app, then the selector for this particular kubectl expose would also be app equal to node app. Okay, so once we've done that, the next thing that we need to do is we need to expose the ports. So the port for a particular port that you would expose would be 8080. And similarly, the port for the container which contains our node application is also port 8080. So let me show you that application once again. So if you look at the application, you can see that port 8080 is being exposed for this particular application. So the target app here would also be port 8080. So let's run this particular command. So this looks fine. So let's run this. Sorry, so this should be target port and not target app. Okay, you can see that the service has been created. So let's do a kubectl get service. And here you can see that this particular service has been created and this has this particular cluster IP address. Okay, so the next thing that we will do is we will see what the selector is for this particular service. So in this particular section, I am referring to the cluster IP and the service as the same thing. Now these are different terms and as we proceed in the next chapter or in the next chapters, you'll see that cluster IP is a type of service and there are other services like your node port and your load balancer as well. So for this particular chapter, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm mentioning cluster IP as a service. So let's do a kubectl describe node app. So when I run this, there should be a selector that is associated with this particular cluster IP. So let's run this and see if there is. Here I need to also mention the service. So it's a type service. So here it should be kubectl describe service node app. And here, if you look at the selector, so the selector here is also app equal to node app. So that no, so now that is because when we had created this particular deployment, we had given the deployment as node app, and this automatically gets selected as the selector. So once we've done this, let's go back to our diagram again. Okay, so now that we've created a cluster IP, which has a selector of this particular app equal to node app. So what will happen is this particular cluster IP will group all these nodes together as a single entity. So now that we've done that, the next thing that we need to do is we need to log into our HTTPD server. And then let's ping this particular cluster IP and let's see what is the result that we get after that. So let's go back to our console, let's clear our screen. So all that we need to do now is we just need to do a kubectl exec httpd. Let's run it in an interactive mode, bin bash.
Okay, so now that we are in our Apache web server, let's do a curl command on that particular cluster IP. So I let's get the cluster IP. So let's run another. So here I've created another PowerShell. So let's get the cluster IP. So what I need to do is kubectl get service. So this is the cluster IP of our node app. So let's copy this and let's paste it here. And once again, the port that I had exposed was port 8080. And here you can see the ad IP address. So this is the IP address that is returned. So it is 172.17.0.10. So let's run this particular command again. And now you can see that there is a, another address that is returned. And let's run it once more. And here you can see for the third time it returned another address. And similarly, it will return any one of these. So what you see here is basically a sort of a load balancing that is happening. So if you go back to the diagram, you can see that whenever this particular IP address is being called, it could just call any one of these particular node app pods and any of one of them could be sent back as a response. So that is one. Okay, so that is it for this lecture. So in this lecture, you learn that your cluster IP can act as a load balancer, provided that the selector you have for your cluster IP service matches the labels that are present in the pods. So in this particular example, the selector was app equal to node app and the labels for all the pods within that particular deployment was also similarly app equal to node app. So that's the reason why it was able to load balance between all these three pods. So I hope this was a useful lecture. Now selectors and labels are a very important concept in Kubernetes. So I hope you've understood how this works. So if you have any issues with this, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. I'll gladly help you out. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, so in, okay, so in our previous example, we had used the HTTPD pod to connect to our Nginx pod using the cluster IP ID. Now this is only possible because both these pods were within the same Kubernetes cluster. Now let's suppose, now let's suppose that you want to connect to your Nginx server from an outside network. Now how would you do that? So currently there are a few methods in which you can do that. The first one is using the node port and the second one is using a load balancer. So in this particular example, we'll talk about how you can use your node port to connect to your Nginx server. So let's see how we can do that. So let's go back to our console again. Okay, so to create a node port, what you need to do is again run the kubectl expose command. And what we need to expose is the node app deployment. So the deployment would again be node app. And then we need to again assign the port. So the port that this particular port would be listening to would be port 8080. And the target port again would be port 8080. Now this is the same application that we had used in our previous chapter. So this would remain the same. So this is port 8080. So this is the node application that we've used. And then we need to add extra one. And then we need to add one extra parameter. That is the type. So the type is again going to be node port. So let's run this particular command. And here you can see that the service has been created. So let's do a kubectl get service. Okay, so when you do a kubectl get service, you can see that there's a new entry that gets added and this is of type node port. And if you look at the port, you can see that there is a mapping of port 8080 of your particular pod to the, map, to the port 30607 of your particular node, which contains this particular pod. So this is important to note. And one thing to note is that this particular port would be open for all the nodes within this particular Kubernetes cluster. So here you can see that there is only one node. Now let's assume that there are multiple nodes, worker nodes, then all those nodes would have this port open so that it can listen to the particular pod, the Nginx pod within it. Okay, so now that you've done that, now that you've created your node port, let's try to access this particular application. Now to do that, what you need to do if you're using Minikube is to use a tunneling mechanism. To do that, what you need to run is just the Minikube service. The name of your service is again node app, as mentioned here. And then you need to do a URL, slash slash URL. So let's run this command. And this will create a tunnel to this particular port. So let's wait for this particular tunnel to get created. And here you can see that a URL gets created. And this particular URL, through this particular URL, you'll be able to connect to a node application externally. So let's copy this and let's run this particular URL.
And if you run this URL, you'll get an output that looks like this. So this is basically the output of the node application as seen in our previous chapter. And it just returns the IP address of our particular pod. So that's it for this lecture. So in this lecture, you were able to connect to your pod externally. Okay, so that's it for this chapter. In the next chapter, we will revise all the learnings that we've done in our previous section. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, so before we proceed any further, let's just have a recap on all, on all that we have done so far. So the first command that we ran was the mini kube start to create a Kubernetes cluster with one node. And this node contains both the master as well as the slave. After we've created the cluster, the next command that we ran was the kubectl run command to create a pod within our particular node. And this was the HTTP deep pod that we had created. And similarly, we had used the kubectl create deployment to create pods. So in this particular example, I had created three replicas and thereby three pods got created of the same type, that is the Nginx pod within our particular node. So the advantage of using the deployment is that the state is always maintained. So even if one of the pod goes down again, a new pod would get regenerated because of the deployment. So there is always a state where three particular pods would always be present of a type Nginx. And these particular pods belong to a namespace called as default. Now, different namespaces can be given as well. And that is something that we'll discuss in the upcoming chapters where, where we can create pods within different namespaces. And after this, we had used a service of type cluster IP. So the cluster IP makes sure that pods within a single Kubernetes cluster is able to communicate with each other. So now if you want your Kubernetes cluster to be exposed to the outside world, we had used something called as node port. So, so the node port, so the node port exposed one of the ports of that particular node and made it available to the public. This particular node port and cluster IP is part of the service component of Kubernetes. So this is again something that we'll discuss in depth in the later upcoming chapters. And after that, finally, we use the minikube service nginx URL command to access that particular node port that we had created. So that's it for this lecture. So this is just a brief overview on how Kubernetes actually works. So that's it for this chapter. In this particular chapter, we had a very brief overview on some of the important objects of Kubernetes, which includes things like deployment, cluster IP, node port, etc. So in the upcoming chapters, we'll discuss more in depth about all the other components that make up Kubernetes. So I'll see in the upcoming chapters. Okay, so in this particular section, we'll talk about another very important command called kubectl apply. So in our previous chapters, we had used the kubectl create as well as kubectl expose to create our deployments and services. However, this is only applicable if you're creating small projects where there are only a few containers or few pods that need to be created. If you are creating large projects, then what you would need to use is the kubectl apply command. And this particular kubectl apply command can be pointed to a directory. And this particular directory can contain multiple YAML or JSON files. And your kubectl will pass through all of them and create all the resources within those YAML files. Whereas your kubectl create can pass through just one particular YAML file. So that is one important difference between your create and apply. So your create can pass through just one YAML file. Whereas if you're using kubectl apply, you can actually pass through either a single file or even a directory which contains multiple YAML files. Another very important difference is kubectl create is imperative in nature, whereas kubectl apply is declarative. So that difference is something that I'll talk about in the next chapter. So Till now, we had never used a YAML file to create our pods or deployments. So in the next chapter, we'll talk about how you can create your YAML files, all the declarations and all the syntax that you need to put within your YAML file. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, so in our previous chapter, we had created the Kubernetes objects like deployments, pods, services, etc., using the command line, that is the kubectl create and the kubectl expose command. So there is another way in which you can create these Kubernetes objects like deployments, services, pods, etc., And that is using your configuration file. And these configuration file, irrespective of what object you are creating, would have these four parameters. That is the API version, the kind, the metadata, and the spec. So the API version tells you which particular version of the Kubernetes APIs you're using to create that particular object. Now this varies based on what kind of object you're creating. So the kind parameter decides as to what kind of object you want to create. Now, this could be anything from a deployment to a service to a pod, etc. And then there is the metadata. So the metadata is used to uniquely identify the object. So within the metadata could be a name, and that particular name defines that particular deployment or any other object that you are creating. 
And finally, there is the spec. And the spec decides as to what state you desire that particular object to be. So let's create a particular YAML configuration file to create a particular pod in our Kubernetes cluster. So I will see you in the next chapter. And I'll show you how you can create your own configuration file. So I'll see you there. OK, so let's use a configuration.yaml file to create our first Kubernetes object. So what we'll create is a pod. So this is basically the URL that you need to refer to to create any Kubernetes objects. And this particular URL, I'll give in the description of the resource below. So you can just check it out. So what we need to create is basically a pod. So to do that, your pod would fall under the workload resource. So you can just open this. And within that, you'll find your pod. So you can just click on this particular pod. And here it will tell you all the parameters that you need to fill in. So here is basically an example of all the keys within a key within a YAML configuration file. So let's populate each one of them one by one. So here the API version is v1. So let's copy this and let's paste it here. The kind is pod. So again, let me copy this. And within the metadata, let's open the object meta and let's see what are the parameters you can fill in here. So here you can fill in the name, the generate name, the namespace, labels, annotations, etc. So, so let's just fill in the name. So let's keep this as my first pod. So let's just fill in the name. So as we proceed further in the course, we'll also fill in the other parameters. So currently, let's just fill in the name and let's just proceed. And now let's look at the spec. So let's look at all the parameters that you need to fill in for that particular spec. So let's click on pod spec. And here, the first parameter that you need to fill is basically the containers. And you can see here that it's a list. So you can fill in a list of containers. So let's do that. So let's copy this and let's paste it here. And this is again, like I stated previously, a list. So let's see what the list contains within this particular containers parameter. So if I open this, so what I need to add here is basically the name. So let's copy this name. So once again, I stated previously, it's a list. So it has to start with a dash. And let's just give a name for this particular container. So what I'll add in this container is Nginx. And again, I also need to add an image. So this particular copy, image also I'll copy and this will be just an nginx that I'll pick up from my docker or uh, repository so this again will be just pointing to the latest and let's just keep it as it is so this is the most basic pod that you can create so what I've done here is I've just added the API version the kind the metadata and the spec and with and within this particular spec what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a container and this container would have a name of nginx and it will pick it up from the nginx latest uh, docker repository. So now let's expand this and let's run this particular YAML file. So the name of my particular file is pod.yaml. So to do that, I'm going to use the kubectl apply command. So let's do the kubectl apply. And let's just give an slash f and point it to the pod.yaml file that I just created and your pod has been created. So let's do a kubectl get pods. And you can see that it's creating this particular myfest pod. So this myfest pod is basically the name that I had mentioned in my metadata. And it's in container creating status. So let's just give it a few more seconds and let's run this command again. And after a few seconds, let's run this kubectl get pods again. And you can see that my first pod is in a running status. So that is how you can create your uh, YAML configuration file. So I hope this was a useful lecture. So please do try this out at your place and just be aware of all the syntax and look at the documentation before you run the kubectl apply command. So I will see you in the next chapter. OK, now let's talk about a very important concept in Kubernetes called volumes. Now, before talking about volumes, let me give you a brief example as to why you would need something like a volume. Now, let's assume. Now let's assume that you have a MySQL container which resides in a pod. Now for some reason, this particular pod goes down. Now the problem here is all the data that resides within your MySQL database would also go down, which would completely jeopardize your application. Now to avoid a situation like this, what you would need is you would need an external storage and this particular storage would be connected to the MySQL database. Now this external storage will store all the data that resides within the database. Now the advantage here is that even if that pod goes down, 
your data is still secure within that external storage. So even if your pod goes down, you can always recreate a new pod and connect it to the same storage and your database would still function properly. So this is one of the very important use cases of using volumes. So whenever you want your data to persist beyond the life cycle of your particular pod, then you would definitely need to use volumes. Now at its core, a volume is a directory, possibly with some data in it, which is accessible to the containers in the pod. Now how the directory comes to be, the medium that backs it and the contents of it are determined by the particular volume type used. Now, whenever you're creating a pod and if you need to mount a volume on it, you also need to specify the dot spec dot volume, which will tell you the volume to provide for that particular pod, as well as the dot spec dot containers dot volume mounts. This will tell you where in that particular container the volume has been mounted. So these two are something that we'll talk about when we start doing a few examples. Now let's talk about the type of volumes that can be used. So in Kubernetes, there are multiple types of volumes that can be used. Kubernetes also provides modules that enables it to connect to different cloud providers block storage for example for aws azure and gcp now i will show you in the following chapters how you can connect your azure disk to your kubernetes cluster now apart from that there is also something called as the host path the empty directory as well as a persistent volume claim now these are things that i'll explain in the upcoming chapters so let's start off by talking about host path so i'll see you in the next chapter Okay, so now let's talk about host path. So in a host path, the volume mounts a file or a directory from the host nodes file system into your pod. Now here is a very small snippet of a particular pod that we're creating. Now in this particular pod, we've mounted a volume and here the volume is mounted from the host path directory slash data. And this particular host path directory will be mounted on this particular path in our particular pod that we're going to create. So now let's create a particular pod and let's set these particular variables to that particular pod. So let's go to our console. Okay, so before we create a pod, let's look at the configuration of this particular pod. Now again, we'll be using the Nginx latest image to create a pod. And here the volume that it will access would be the slash data within our node that contains this particular pod. And this particular date slash data would be mount on this particular path within our particular pod that we'll create. So now let's create this particular pod. Now again, let's run the kubectl apply command. So it's kubectl apply and the path is basically the name of this particular file, which is hostpath.yaml. Let's run this particular apply. Okay, so our pod has been created. So let's do a kubectl get pods. Okay, so it's creating this particular container. Okay, so now our container has been created. So let's access this particular container. To do that, let's run the kubectl exec. The name of our pod is test pod, test pd. We'll run this in the interactive mode. And we'll use the slash bin slash bash command. Okay, the first thing we'll do is we'll see if this particular path exists. So let's copy this. And let's do a cd. Let's do an ls. And as you can see that there is a path by this particular name. So what we'll do is we'll create a few files in this particular path, abc. Okay, so now that we've created these two files, now these two files would also be available in this particular path of that node that we've created. So since we're using Minikube, Minikube has only one node running. So what we can do is we can access that particular node and see whether if in this particular data, these two files are present. So to do that, I'm currently using my Docker container. So let's go to our Docker container UI. And here you can see that we have our Minikube running. So let's try to access this Minikube. So since I'm using the UI, so this is fairly straightforward. So all that I need to do is I just need to open the CLI for this particular container. And let's go to the slash CD data. And if I do an ls, and you can see that those two files are present here as well. So similarly, what I'll do is I'll do a touch. A -A -A. So I'll create another file by this name. I'll do an ls. And this particular file should also be accessible within our pod. So again, let's go back to our pod. And all that I need to do, so again, I'm back in my pod again. All that I need to do is I just need to do an ls. And you can see that that particular file is also accessible here. 
Okay, so the next thing that I'll do is I'll exit this particular pod. I will delete this pod and recreate a new one. So let's see what happens when we do that. So let's do a kubectl delete pod. And let's delete this particular pod. Okay, so now that we've deleted our pod, let's create a new one using the same configuration. So again, I'll do a kubectl apply. And a pod has been created. So let's try to access this particular pod. So let's do a kubectl exec test pd. And if I go back to my And if I do an LS, and you can see that those files are still present, and you can still see that these files are present. And that's because these files exist within the slash data of that node that we had created in Minikube. So I hope this was a useful lecture. In the next lecture, we'll talk about empty directory. So I'll see you there. Okay, so in our previous chapter, we talked about the host path. Now in this particular chapter, we'll talk about empty directory. So an empty directory volume is created when a pod is assigned to a node and exists as long as the pod is running on that particular node. Now, as the name suggests, the empty directory volume is initially empty and all containers in that particular pod can read and write the same files in the empty directory. Now, even though the volume can be mounted at the same or different paths in each container. Now, some of the reasons as to why you would use empty directory includes you could use it, use it as a scratch space or you could even use it for checklisting a long computation for recovery from crashes. Now, this is how the spec looks like for empty directory. Now, here the only difference is that underneath the volume, you need to specify the empty directory like this. Now, let's create an empty directory pod. So, let's go back to our console. Okay, so in our previous chapter, we had created a host path. So, let's convert this into an empty directory. So, I'll remove everything from my volume. So, here the host path becomes empty directory. And it's an open and shut curly brace here and that's about it so here the volume is an empty directory and you can mount it to any particular path within this particular pod so let's mount it to a path called uh, empty so we have so we are mounting it to this particular path so let's create this particular pod so let's just name this as test pd empty directory and let's create this particular pod. So let me clear my screen. So all that I need to do is I need to do a kubectl apply. And the name of my file is again hostpath.yml. So let's run this particular command. Okay, so our pod is created. So let's wait for this particular container to get created. So let's do a kubectl get pods and you can see that the container within this particular pod is getting created so let's wait for a few minutes okay so our pod has been created so let's log into this particular pod i'll run the kubectl exec slash interactive And all that I need to do is I need to see if there is an empty directory. So let's do a CD empty. And you can see an empty directory has been created. So all I call so here what I can do is I can temporarily store files and folders here. So let's create a file called ABC. Let's create a folder as well. So let's call this as folder one. So here you can see I've created a file and a folder. Now what I need to do is I need to exit out of this and let's delete this particular pod. And if I recreate a new pod, what should happen is that this particular empty folder should not have any data in it. That's because the 
empty directory data only persists as long as the pod persists. So once the pod gets deleted, all the entries within this particular empty directory will also get deleted. So let's try it out. Let's create another pod with the same configuration. So let's do that. And let's do a get pod. And you can see that this particular pod is getting created again. Okay, so again, I've created my new pod. So let's do a CD empty. And if I do an LS, you can see that there's no data and all the data that I created previously has been deleted. So, okay, so once again, you can use the empty directory as a scratch space or for checkpointing purposes. So that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so in our previous chapter, we had created a volume using the host path as well as using the empty directory. Now, there are many ways in which you can create your volumes. You could use something called as the AWS Elastic Store. Or you could even use something called as a GCP persistent disk to create your volume. Now the problem here is you as a creator of these pods, you are not aware of all the storages that are available in your cluster. So what generally happens is that you have an administrator and the job of this administrator is to create the volume and you as a user or a creator of these pods, your job is just to access those particular volumes, not knowing what is running in the background and not knowing what is the actual storage that is used in the background. So what we need is a new abstraction and this particular new abstraction will hide from the user or the creator of this particular pod what the underlying storage is. And that particular abstraction is called as the persistent volume. So a persistent volume is a piece of storage in the cluster that has been provisioned by an administrator or it can be dynamically provisioned using something called as a storage class. And you as a user, what you need to use is something called as a persistent volume claim, and that is a request for storage by a particular user. So the job of the cluster administrator is to create a particular storage. And if you look at this particular example, and if you look at this particular example, what you see is that this is basically a YAML that would be run by the cluster administrator. And his job is to provision storage. And this particular YAML is provisioning storage using the host path. Now, this could be anything. This could be even a GCP or AWS or an Azure disk. So this is based on how your cluster administrator wants to create this particular storage. And once this particular storage has been created by the administrator, you as a creator of that particular pod or a cluster user, you can use this particular storage using something called as a persistent volume claim. And then this particular persistent volume claim, you just need to mention what is the access mode that you want for the storage and some other information like how much storage you would need. So for example, in this particular example, I need three GB of storage. And this particular claim can be used when you're creating your particular pod. So here I'm creating a pod as usual. And here the only difference is that in your volume, what you need to mention is just the persistent volume claim. And this persistent volume claim is the persistent volume claim that you've created here. And again, everything else remains the same. The volume mount is basically the path on which this particular persistent volume claim would be mounted. So that's how your persistent volume works. So it's basically an abstraction that hides from the cluster user what the underlying storage is. So in our next chapter, we'll see how you can create a persistent storage. So I'll see you there. Okay, so here is a configuration for a persistent volume. So here the kind is persistent volume. The metadata name that I've given is task PV volume. And here within the spec, I've mentioned the storage class name and the storage class name that I mentioned is manual. Now this particular storage class name will be used in the claim for this particular storage and whether, and if that particular claim has the same storage class name, then that particular claim will be attached to the same volume. Now the capacity I've given is 10 GB and the access mode is read write once. And here the underlying storage that I'm going to be using is going to be host. Now this can change based on the underlying storage that you need. So for our example, let's give this as host path. Now this can be anything from an Azure disk to a AWS to a GCP disk. So this is based on the preference of your administrator. And the path that I've given is MNT data within this particular host path. So here is how you can create your persistent volume. So let's create a persistent volume. Let's run our terminal. And all that I need to do, do is just run the kubectl apply command. And let's run this particular YAML file. Okay, so our YAML has been executed. So let's do a kubectl get. And now here, what I need to get is this particular persistent volume. So it's not going to be a pod or a deployment. It's going to be a persistent volume. So let's see the output that we get. 
And here you can see that this particular persistent volume has been created and it has a 10 GB capacity and the storage class name is manual and the status currently is available because this is not bound to any particular claim as yet and the access mode is read write once. So now let's create a claim and let's attach that particular claim to this particular volume. So let's go to our volume claim.yml. So here within this volume claim, the important thing again is basically the kind here is going to be persistent volume claim. And here the storage claim name is important. Now this particular name has to match with the same name that is there in the persistent volume. Now apart from that, you can give the access mode as read write once. And the storage that I require for this particular claim is 3 GB. Now let's see what happens if I change this storage class name to something else. Let's make this as manual one and let's run this particular claim. So again, let's do the kubectl apply persistent volume claim. So I'm going to run this particular claim. So let's run this. And this particular volume claim has been created. So let's do a kubectl get a persistent volume claim. Now you can see that this particular volume claim is still in a pending status. Now that's because it's not found any volume that has this particular storage class. So what we'll do is we'll delete this and we'll recreate a new one with the storage class name as one. So let's delete this particular volume claim. So it has a name of task PV claim. So let's delete this and let's clear the screen and let's run this claim again. And this time I've changed the storage class name to manual. And again, a claim has been created. So now let's do a get persistent volume claim and let's see what the output now is. And now you can see that it is bound. It is bound to that particular storage that we had previously said. Now let's also do a kubectl get for the persistent volume. And you can see that our persistent volume is currently bound to it used to be available. Now this particular volume has been bound to this particular claim. And you can see that the claim is mentioned here as well. Okay, so now that we have created our claim and now that we have created our storage, the next thing that we'll do is we'll create a pod with an Nginx container running on it. And what we'll do here is we'll use this particular mount path and it's on this particular mount path that Nginx reads the HTML page. And on this particular mount path, we will mount a particular storage using the task PV claim. So you can see that the volume mount here is basically mount on this particular path. So all that we need to do is we need to create an HTML page and we need to put that on this particular persistent volume that is MNT data. So let's do that. Now, since we are running it on a, a mini cube node, let's open our mini cube and within this particular MNT data, let's add our index.html page. So again, to do that, let's open our Docker. So I have my Docker UI with me. So I've opened my Docker UI. So all that I need to do is I need to log into this particular container. So let me open this container CLI. So here, what I'm just doing is I'm just running the Docker exec command for this particular container. And here, what I need to do is I need to go to my MNT and within that there is data. And within this, I need to create an index.html file. So let's do that. Let's create an index.html. So here, let's just add some HTML tags. So let's just so here, so here I'm just inserting a hello world in a h1 tag. So let's close this and let's do an ls again. And you can see that there's an index.html. So all that I need to do is I just need to create that particular pod now. So let's go back to our VS code and let's do a kubectl apply again. And all that I need to do is I just need to do a apply on this particular nginx file. Okay, now let's do a kubectl get pods. And you can see that our pod has been created. So let's in so let's get into this particular pod. So again, let's do a kubectl exec task pv pod. And let's do an interactive mode and let's open it with pin bash. And all that I need to do is I just need to do a curl on my local host and it should 
display to me that index.html page that I created. Now, before doing that, I need to install curl because. Okay, so curl is present. So all that I need to do is just do a curl localhost. And let's see the output that you get. So you, here you can see the output is basically the HTML file that is there in my MNT data. So again, the next thing that we can do is we can change this particular file and let's see what happens. So again, let's do a VI on our index.html and let's insert something else as well. Let's insert version one. And let's save this. And now let's do a curl again. And you can see that it's hello world version one. So it's basically picking up this data from the MNT data. And that particular volume is mounted on this particular path. And it's from this particular path that our Nginx read is reading the HTML page. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so now let's talk about dynamic provisioning. In our previous chapter, we had seen how a cluster administrator can create volumes using the persistent volume object. Now there's a better way of creating volumes and that is by using something called as dynamic provisioning. So dynamic volume provisioning allows storage volumes to be created on demand. Now to create dynamic volume provisioning, you need to use something called as a storage class. Okay, so now let's look at a few examples of storage classes. Now these are a few examples of storage classes for different cloud providers. So this is for Google Compute Engine Persistent Disk. So here the provisioner is provided by Kubernetes itself. And it is of type parameters PD standard. So this is a specific storage class for a standard persistent disk. And similarly, this is one for your SSD persistent disk. And these two are for Google Compute Engine. And this is a provisioner that is used for your Azure file. And this is of type standard LRS. So similarly, you can create storage classes for multiple cloud vendors like Azure GCP and AWS. Okay, so now let's look at the dynamic provisioning for Minikube. So whenever you create your Minikube cluster, there is a storage class that gets automatically created and it has a provisioner for Minikube host path. So it takes the base storage from your Minikube host path itself. So let's look at this example and let's see how this works. Okay, to get information about your default storage class, all that you need to run is the kubectl get storage class. And here it shows you the default storage class that is created. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this particular storage class to create our persistent volume claim. And that claim again can be used by a pod. So let's see how we can do that. So let's go back. Okay, so now let's go back to our console and let's look at our previous example. So in our previous example, we had given the storage class name as manual. And this particular manual had to be also mentioned in our claim as well. So here the only difference is you can either remove this particular storage class name and if you do that, then this particular claim will take its storage from the dynamic provisioner, the standard dynamic provisioner, or what you can do is you can just make this as standard. And when I do that, then it's gonna take this particular storage claim from this particular storage class that is automatically or created by default. So all that you need to do is you just need to either remove the storage class name or just keep this as standard. Okay, so once we've created this, let's run this particular claim now. So all that I need to do is I just need to run the kubectl apply and let's run this particular claim. And you can see that our claim has been created. So let's do a kubectl get persistent volume claim. And you can see that this particular claim has been created and it uses the standard storage class as standard. So this is basically the dynamic storage class that is created by default and everything else remains the same. So you can use this particular claim in your pod while creating volume. So that's it for this lecture. So this was a very useful lecture and this will come in handy, especially once we deal with your stateful sets. So I will see you in the next chapter. Okay, so before we start talking about stateful sets, there is another concept that I would want you to know. And that is something called as a headless service. So in a headless service, whenever you're creating one, the cluster IP is always set to none. So let's use one of the previous deployments that we had created. So we're gonna create an Nginx with three replicas and we're gonna connect it to this particular headless service. So here again, it's a normal service and the only difference is that the cluster IP address is none. But before setting it to none, let's see what happens if you do not set this to none. So let's cancel this.
So let's remove this cluster IP equal to none and let's see what the behavior is when we do not use this and let's save this and let's run this kubectl up using the kubectl apply command. So I will create both the deployment as well as the service. And let me create the service as well. So I've created both the deployment as well as the service. So let's do a kubectl get pods and let's see whether the pods have been created. And you can see that these three pods have been created. And now let's look at the services. And you can see that the Nginx service has been created with this particular cluster IP. So, let's, so one thing to note is that Kubernetes creates DNS entries for both services and pods. Now there is a very important page that I would like you guys to refer to. So this particular page I'll give in the description below. So it, so it mentions here that you can have DNS set for both services and pods. So you can just go through this documentation. So it mentions here that what are the objects that get DNS records. So it mentions here that services and pods, they both get DNS records. So what we'll do is we'll create another pod and using that particular pod, we will try to do an NS lookup on the service that we've created. That is this particular service. And let's see what we get as the output. So I've already created a pod like that. So it's called kubectl get pods. So this is the name of that particular pod. Now the, now the image for this particular pod, I will give in the description below. So you can just check that out. So all that I need to do is I need to log into this particular pod and I need to do an NS lookup on this particular service. So let's do a kubectl exec on nginx or oh, sorry on this particular pod and all that i need to do is i need to do an ns lookup on this particular service and when i do an ns lookup you can see that the output that i get is this particular ip address and this is basically the cluster IP address of our service. And this is basically the domain name for this particular service. So this domain is attached to this particular IP address. Okay, so the next thing that we'll do is we'll again go back to our service. And now let's add cluster IP equal to none. And let's run this service again. So all that I need to do is I need to delete the service and recreate it once. So let's exit out of this. Let me clear this. Let's do a kubectl delete service. Nginx. And let's create the service again. Okay. And now let's do a kubectl get service. And you can see that now this particular Nginx is not associated with any cluster IP. So what if I do an Nginx lookup again, like done previously, what is the output I get? So previously when I had the cluster IP, the output I got for Nginx was the cluster IP associated with it. Now, because there is no cluster IP, let's see what the output we get is. So again, let's do an Nginx on this particular, sorry, let's do an NS lookup on this particular nginx again service again and now you can see the difference is that it no longer associates itself with this particular cluster ip because there is none but instead what it does is it associates this particular service with all the pods and the corresponding pods ip address so okay so whenever okay so whenever there is a situation where you do not want to associate your pods or your deployment with any load balancing, then what you would do is you would want to give your service with a cluster IP of none. Now this comes in especially useful when you're creating your stateful sets and that's precisely what we'll see in our next chapter. So I'll see you there.
Okay, so in our previous example, we had used the kind deployment to create our pods. So in this particular example, you can see that we've created three replicas of our pods. So let's do a kubectl get pods. And you can see that these are the three replicas that we've created. Now, one thing to note is that if I remove one of these pods, let's say I deleted this particular pod, let's do a kubectl. And let me delete this particular pod. So what happens is that a new pod gets recreated and that new pod has got a completely different identity altogether. So let's do a kubectl get pods again. And you can see that there is no pod that gets created by this particular name. And another thing to note is whenever you're creating a deployment, you cannot associate each one of these pods to a separate volume. Now that is not possible. And the third disadvantage is that you cannot associate a single distinct network identity to each pod. So in this particular deployment, you can see that I've created again a clusterless service. And again, let's do a kubectl exec on our DNS test. So this is just based on the experiments that we had done in our previous section. So let's log in. And if I do an NS lookup, on our particular service here, you can see that the NS lookup gives this particular identity for each pod. Now this particular identity is, prob is troublesome because it is basically associated with this IP address. So whenever I remove a pod and recreate a new one, there is a possibility that this particular IP address might change as well. Now, if you want to overcome these issues, then what you need to create is, called, is something called as a stateful set. Now let's see how we can create a stateful set. Now a stateful set is a workload API object that is used to manage stateful applications. Now like a deployment, a stateful set can manage pods that are based on an identical container spec. So this is similar to what we had done while creating a deployment. So you can give replicas and create identical specs for your pods. So a stateful set maintains a sticky identity for each pod. Now these pods are created from the same spec but are not interchangeable. Now each has a persistent identifier that it maintains even if it reschedules or if it restarts or if it has to be redeployed. Now some of the key identi identifiers for your stateful set is that a stable unique network identifier is provided. So that's something we'll see. And similarly, there's also a stable persistent storage for your sta stateful set. And there's also something called as ordered grateful, graceful deployment and scaling as well as ordered rolling updates. So these are things that we'll see in this particular course. Now let's now, when you, so whenever you create your pod, so whenever you create your, so whenever you create your pods using your stateful set, it gets created with a unique ID. So in this particular example, you can see that the unique ID associated with that pod is that zero. Now, similarly, you can also create multiple pods with a unique ID. So in this particular example, you can see that I've created three Nginx pods and each of them have a specific name that is web zero, web one, and web two. And another thing to note is, you can also create distinct storage for each of these pods. Now this can only be done using your dynamic persistent volume. Now that's one of the limitations. Now another thing that you can do is you can also have a stable and unique network identifier. Now that is using something called as the headless service that we had learned in our previous section. Now whenever you're creating a headless service for a stateless set, there is a difference in the domain that gets created. And that's something that we will see as we do, as we proceed towards in the example. So now the advantage of this particular architecture is that let's say you removed one of the pods or it got, it got deleted or rescheduled. Now whenever you create a new pod, that new pod will get created with the same name that is web1. So now let's look at the configuration for a stateful set. Okay, so now let's look at the configuration for a stateful set. Now here everything remains the same. The only difference is that the kind here instead of deployment becomes stateful set. And the other unique differentiating factor for a stateful set is there's something called as a volume claim template. And this volume claim template derives storage from your dynamic persistent volume. That's something that we had learned in the previous chapter. So you just go check that out. The link about the dynamic persistent volume I will give in the description below. So you can just go check that out once again for reference. Now, it is this particular volume claim template that gives each particular replica, that is two replicas, its own distinct volume. So apart from the stateful set, the next thing I'll create is basically a service. And this is going to be a very simple service with the cluster IP as none. So these are the two 
objects a kubernetes objects that i'll create so let's click on our terminal and let's create these two kubernetes objects so let's do a kubectl and let's run this particular yaml file and here you can see that two of our objects have been created one is the service and the other is the stateful set okay so the first thing that we'll do is we'll do an ns lookup on this particular service and let's see what the difference is let's go to our kubectl get pods and let's log into our DNS test. Now let's do a NS lookup on a service engine X. Now you can see the difference here is that this particular IP address is associated with this particular name that is web1 nginx default and this particular IP address that is the second replica is associated with this name. So here the dif difference you can see is that these two names will never change because it's not based on the IP address as previously seen by the deployment. So even if I recreate that particular pod or if it gets deleted and a new one gets recreated that particular new ip address would still be associated with this particular name so that is how your network identity always remains the same so that's one of the distinguishing factors about using your using a stateful set rather than using your deployment so now let's exit out of this the next thing i'll do is i'll do an ns uh, let's do a kubectl get pods and let's see how this looks like and here you can see that there is a unique name that is associated with both these replicas so it's web0 and web1 so even if i delete one of these pods so let's assume that i want to delete this pod so let's do that let's do a kubectl delete pods and let's delete this particular pod and let's see what happens when i do a kubectl get pods again And you can see that it got recreated with the same name. So here you can see that the identity persists. So even if I delete or if I recreate or reschedule a new one, it will still maintain that particular identity. So that is one important thing to note. And similarly, the volume that is bound to each of these pods will also persist. So let's try that out. So what we'll do is we'll log into one of these pods and we will write something to the volume and we will delete that particular pod and let's see whether that particular volumes data persists so let's do that let's do a kubectl exec web0 interactive slash bin slash bash okay so what i need to do is i need to write something into the index.html file so let's do that so what i'll do is i'll go to this particular path so let's copy this And it's, the volume is mounted on this particular path. So that's the reason why I'm going to this particular path. So let's do a CD LS. So here I need to create an index.html file. So let's do that. So let's install VI Vim. So let's do a sudo, uh, let's do an apt get update. And here, let's just insert some piece of code. So let's do an H1. And let's just call this as web0. And that's the only thing that we'll do. So we'll exit out of this and let's try to access this particular web page. So let's do an exit. And now let's try to log into our DNS test again. So let's log into our DNS test. And let's do an NS lookup. on nginx this is the service that we had used so what i need to do is i need to do a wget for this particular endpoint and let's see what the output we get is and you can see that we get this web zero so this is basically derived from that same volume and the thing that i can do is let's open another terminal so let's go and open another terminal and here let's do a kubectl get pods and let's delete this pod and let's see what happens so let's do a kubectl delete 
pod so this has basically deleted this particular pod and when it recreates that new pod that new pod would be associated with that same volume now to check whether that has happened again let's go back to our previous page and let's do a wget for this particular page again using the same url or the endpoint and again you can see that i get this web zero that means that particular page has still that particular page still persists so let's see whether that has happened let's do an exit and let's again do a kubectl exec on web zero and let's go to that path again. I'll copy the same path, do an ls and you can see that that index.html file has still remained even though I had deleted that particular pod and recreated a new, new one. So what this means is that even when my pod got deleted, the volume that was associated with that pod still persisted and remained. So one another thing to remember is that you need to delete the volume even after the pod has been deleted or after the stateful set has been deleted. So that has to be manually deleted as well so that's another important thing to remember so i hope this was a useful lecture in this lecture you learned how you can create a stateful set now if you have any issues with this please get in touch with me i'll gladly help you out i'll see you in the next chapter okay so now let's talk about daemon set a daemon set ensures that all nodes within a cluster runs a single copy of a particular pod so as nodes are added into your cluster pods also get added into them now as nodes are removed from the cluster these pods are also garbage collected now deleting a daemon set will clean up the pods that is also created. So now some of the typical scenarios where you would want to use daemon set includes if you want to run a log collection for each node or if you want to run a node monitoring daemon for each node or even a cluster storage for each node then you would need to use something like a daemon set. So now let's look at this Kubernetes cluster. So this Kubernetes cluster has got three nodes. So whenever you run a daemon set what would happen is that one single pod would get deployed in each one of this particular node. So now let's see how we can use this using Minikube. Okay, so I'm back in my console. So the first thing I need to do is I need to create a Minikube cluster with two nodes. So initially in my previous experiments, what I had done is I just run a Minikube start and that just created an environment with a single node. So in this particular example, we need multiple nodes to run daemon set. So let's create it with two nodes. Let's run this particular command. Okay, so we've created a Minikube with multiple cubes. So let's do a kubectl get nodes now. And you can see that there are two nodes currently, that is Minikube and Minikube M02. So let us finish off this section by talking about a very simple configuration that we can make. So let's go back to our example. And here in this example, we still have the old deployment template. So what, we, what we're gonna do is we're gonna convert this into a daemon set. To do that, what I need to do is I just need to change this to daemon set. And here the only difference is that your daemon set can have only one replica per node. So this particular replica needs to be removed. So this becomes irrelevant now. So I'll just remove this. And here you have created a daemon set where an nginx would be uploaded in each node. And that is about it. So if I deploy this, what would happen is that there would be an nginx deployed in each node. So let's run this. So let's do a new terminal. And let's do a kubectl apply on this particular file. And now let's back, go back to a PowerShell and let's do a kubectl get pods. And here I would need to get also information about in which particular node that particular pod belongs to. Let's run this with a slash o wide and let's see the output. And here you can see that I have two pods created and each of these pods are created in different nodes. So this is a very basic example on how you can use your mini cube daemon set. So again, if you go back to the configuration, the configuration remains the same. The only difference is that the kind here becomes daemon set. And now because there are no replicas, because you're just creating one particular pod per node, so you can just remove the replica. And that's the only change. So here in this example, like stated previously, you have an nginx deployed in each node of your particular cluster. So that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so now let's look at the configuration that you need to create your particular job. So here the API version is batch v1 and the kind is job and the metadata object is, let's look at the metadata object here. So here you can give the name and let's give the name as node job here and let's go back. And here within the spec, let's look at the spec for job spec and let's open this. And within this, what you need to give is basically a template. And this is basically a normal pod template spec that we need to give. So let's open this.
And what you need to give within that is basically the container. So what we are going to give is basically a node container. And this node container is going to be named as node. And the image is also going to be a node image. So this let's make this as the latest node image. And apart from that, all that you're going to run within this is just a command that is to fetch the version of the node that we are running. And here, another important parameter that you need to give is the restart policy. Now, this is also a mandatory field that you need to give. So if you are creating a deployment or a stateful set, then the restart policy was defaulted to always. But if you're creating a job, then it either has to be never or on failure. So, and so let's save this and let's run this particular job. So all that I need to do is I just need to run the kubectl apply for this particular job. So let's run this particular command. And you can see that my job has been created. So let's do a kubectl get jobs. And you can see that this particular job is in a running process. So now let's do a kubectl get pods. And you can see that this particular pod has been created and it has completed its particular process as well. Now to see the output of your particular node job, what you need to do is you need to do a kubectl logs and you just need to give the name of your particular pod. And here you can see the version of the node. So this is basically this command that was run and it has logged this particular output as well. So this is the output that you see over here. So that is it for this lecture. I hope this was a useful lecture. So this is a very really simple example on how you can use your uh, jobs. This particular piece of code I'll give in the description below. So you can run this in your local environment as well. So I'll see you in the next chapter. Okay, so now let's talk about Kubernetes secret. So a secret is an object that contains a small amount of sensitive data such as a password or token or a key. Now such information might otherwise be put in a pod configuration directly or in a container image. Now using a secret means that you don't need to include confidential data, data in your application code. Now for this particular example, now in this particular example, what we'll do is we'll create a MySQL database. And in this particular MySQL database, you can see in your left that the password is hard coded. So the value password is basically the hard code for the root, root password. So instead of hard coding this particular password, what we'll do is we'll use a Kubernetes object and we'll use that Kubernetes object to reference that particular password. So let's see how we can do that. Okay, so the first Kubernetes object that you need to create is basically the secret. And in this particular secret, the parameters are quite simple. So the metadata again is basically the name, which is my password. So we'll reference this particular secret by using this particular name. And here the type is very important. So the opaque is generally used for user-defined passwords. So if you go through this particular page, the link to which I'll give in the description below, you can see all the types that are currently available for the secret. So here the opaque represents a uh, user-defined data. Now, if you want to use something, let's say a basic authorization, then you would need to use this particular build type. And similarly for SSH, you would need to use this. But for our perspective, what we just need is just a user string. So we'll be using this user-defined data. So apart from that, this is basically the password that we will be storing and the value of the password would be test123. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll create this particular secret object. Again, let's run it using the kubectl apply command. Okay, so we have created our password. So let's do a kubectl get and the object and the kind here is secret. So and you can see that my password has been created. And what we'll do is we'll use this particular password in our MySQL. So if you go back to our documentation, so Kubernetes has provided a link on how to create a MySQL database. So let's click on this particular tab. So the link to this particular tab, I'll give in the description below. So here, if you look at this particular tab, I'll not go much into details. It's a very straightforward application. So here, if you look at this particular environmental variable, you can see that this particular root password is just hard coded as password. So what we'll do is we will just copy the whole thing. And here, instead of using this value as password, we'll use the secret to populate this particular password. So let's do that. So this particular piece of code, I've just copied in this particular YAML configuration file. So here, what I need to do is I need to replace this particular password with my configuration, uh, my secret configuration. To do that, let's again go back to our secret. So what we need to use is this particular piece of code. So I'll just copy this and let's paste it here. 
So again, the value from is basically from a secret key reference. And here I need to change the name as well as the key. So if you go back to a password, so the name here would be my password. So I'll just copy this. I'll paste it here. And the, here the value again would be just this particular password. So let's copy this and let's paste it here as well. And that's all that you need to do. So now this particular password will be referenced using this particular password.yamls secret. And that's the only change that you need to do. Let's run this. So let's again do a kubectl apply MySQL. So there was an error in this particular. So let's run this again. And you can see that our deployment has been created. So let's wait for this particular pod to be created. So let's do a kubectl get pods. And currently it's creating that container. Okay, so MySQL is running. So let's try to log into this particular instance. Let's do a kubectl exec. And let's do a MySQL slash p. And here let's give the password that we had set over here that is test123. And now using text123, I was able to log into this MySQL instance. So let's exit out of this. And now if I type my environment env, I should also be able to see the password here as well. So if you type env, you can see that this is the password that I had said that is test123 for this particular variable. And this particular variable was again used in our deployment. So that's how you can use your secret in your environmental variable and pass it through your particular pod. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next. Okay, so now let's talk about config map. So a config map is an API object used to store non-confidential data in key value pairs. A config map allows you to decouple environment specific configuration from your container image so that your application are easily portable. A config map is not de de designed to hold large chunks of data. The data that is stored within your config map cannot exceed more than one MB. So some of the examples of non-confidential data would be things like IP address. So IP addresses keep changing regularly. So rather than having to change them in the deployment or within pods, you can change them in the configuration objects and they'll get automatically updated within your deployment. So here you can see that I have created a config object and within this config object, which I have named as node, node config, I have stored my IP address and I have set a value for that particular IP address. Now this particular config map can be used in my deployment. So in my deployment, all that I need to do is I need to get that value from a config map key reference. So this is very similar to the secret key reference that we had used in a previous chapter. So the only difference here is that in our deployment, we need to just give config map key reference rather than secret key reference. And we just need to give the name of that particular config map that we have created. So the name is node config and the same name we need to associate in our deployment. And we also need to associate the key that is the IP address with that particular node config. So in our next chapter, we'll see how we can use this in a live scenario. So I will see you there. <clears throat> okay, in this particular chapter, we'll create two pods. The first pod that Okay, in this particular chapter, we'll create a Okay, in this particular chapter, we'll create a simple node application. So we'll have a node application in, a, in the node pod. And within this particular application, what we'll do is we'll just try to access a MySQL database. So we already have a MySQL database created in our previous chapter. So we'll be using the same database. And within this database, we had used the uh, secret object to reference our particular password. So this was using the environmental variable as I had shown you in the previous chapter. However, in this particular chapter, we'll use the same variable using volume. So rather than accessing it through the secret key reference, we'll use volumes to access that same password. So in this particular chapter, we'll see how we can access the password, uh, the secret using volumes, as well as we'll use the config map to get the IP address for that particular database that we have over here. Let's see how we can do that. And finally, once we've done all this, we'll be using a service to access this particular node application. So let's proceed. So the first thing that we'll do is we already have a MySQL database. We'll insert some data into that. So let's do that. 
So we'll be accessing this particular pod, and within that pod, we'll be inserting some data into the database. So let's start by doing that. So let me open my terminal. Let's click on new terminal. And let's clear the screen. Let's do a kubectl get pods. And uh, SQL, MySQL resides within this particular pod. So let's exec into this and let's try to insert some data. So let's do a kubectl exec. Let's open this in bash. And all that I need to do is just do a MySQL slash p, enter the password, which is test123. And all that I need to do is I need to create a database. So I've already created a database. So it's called test DB. And within this particular database, I've created a table called persons. And this particular persons database has one entry within this. So what I'll do is I will create a node application. And this particular node application should try to get this particular data in a browser. So let's try to do that. Okay, so once we've added data into a database, let's create the config map. So within this config map, I need to add the IP address. So let's remove this IP address and let's get the cluster IP address of that particular SQL database. So let's do a kubectl get service. And my SQL has a cluster IP address of this. Let's copy this and let's paste it over here. And everything else remains the same. Now, again, this is of kind config map. The name of my config map is node config. And the data that I have within this is basically the IP address, which is just the cluster IP address of MySQL database. So now let's run this particular config map and let's create this config map. Again, let's do a kubectl apply. Now, all these files I will give in the description below. So you can just try it out at your end as well. So do not worry about this, these particular configuration files. So I've created my node config as well. So let's do a kubectl get config map. And you can see that my node config was just created a few seconds back. Okay, so now that we've done this, let's go and create a node application. So I've already created my node application, which I have also dockerized. So let me just show you that particular node application. Let's open my file. The, so this is the node piece of code that I'll be running. So all that it does is just as a select star from test DB and gets the output back to the browser. So here are the two important things to remember is that the password as well as the IP address. So the password we are going to store in this particular file called etc foo password and this will be stored as a volume so this is something that i'll show you in the configuration those two things that i need to show you is basically the password which will be stored as a volume and which will be accessed by an fs read file sync and apart from that we also need to get the ip address now the ip address we're going to store as an environmental variable in the ip address using this particular variable so these two are basically the values that will be fed so this is the config map and this is the secret GitHub repo for this particular piece of code, I will give in the description below, as well as the dockerized application. So you do not need to worry about that. It's a very simple, basic application. The main gist of this particular application is just to get this particular value. And again, let me just reach it. There are two things that we need to get. The first is the secret. The secret, which is stored as a volume, we'll get in this particular through this particular piece of line. And again, the other thing is basically the config map, which we'll get through the process env.ip address. So let's look at the configuration of the YAML deployment file for this particular node application. So let's go back. So let me show you the YAML deployment file for that particular application. So it's this node.yaml file. So my application currently resides within this particular Docker container. So this particular Docker, Docker container is a public Docker container. So you can use this as well. Now, apart from that, everything is straightforward. Now let's concentrate on the things that matter. The first is again the config map key reference. So this particular config map key reference will fetch value from this config map that we've just created a few minutes back. So that's this particular node config. And this particular IP address is the key that we need. So we'll be fetching this particular key. Now, apart from this config map, the next thing we need to remember is that we are going to get the password as a volume. So we need to create a volume. And this volume is of type secret. 
And within this, we need to give a secret name of my password. So this is basically the name of the secret that we had created in our previous chapter. So let me show you this as well. So let's do a new terminal. Let's do a cubes CTL get secrets. So we'll be using this particular my password again this particular secret was created in the previous chapter so you can just go have a look at that again and this particular secret will be mounted on this particular file that is etc slash foo so if this foo folder doesn't exist it will create one and within this particular folder this particular password will be stored so that's the only thing that we need to worry about so okay so that's about it now let's run this particular application and let's try to access the value so let's do a kubectl apply on this particular piece of file so this is node.yaml so i already run this previously so let's just do a so once again this particular con deployment is also connected to a service and the name of the service is called node so what i'll be doing is let's check whether we have a service called node created so let's do a kubectl get service and you can see that there is a kubectl node and now all that i need to do is just tunnel this particular service so to do that let's just do a mini cube service and i just need to give the name of this particular service so let's wait for the tunnel to get created And you can see that I get the output. So this is the output. So this is the same data that was there in the database. So I hope this was a useful lecture. So this piece, so this particular code, all the application, I will give in the description below. So you can just try this out at your end as well. So I hope this was a useful lecture. I will see you in the next.